Our speaker this morning is Reverend James Womack, who is the senior pastor of Destiny Church in Fort Worth, Texas. He has served in a local church for more than uh, 13 years, and his passion is to communicate God's word in order that the church might be equipped to carry out her God-given purposes. Dr. Romack, Reverend Romack ministers across America in churches, businesses, national conferences, seminars, and uh, workshops using his gifts of expository teaching and preaching and training to equip saints for effective living and ministry. He formerly served in Dallas as the pastor of Christian education at the Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship Church. And he has served as several years as adjunct professor at Dallas Seminary and is now the senior pastor of Destiny Church in Fort Worth. He received his Bachelor of Business Administration and Masters of Health Services from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. He earned his THM in New Testament from Dallas Seminary. He's been married to his wife, Cynthia, for 14 years, and within the last seven years, they have had five children. Uh, James II, uh, Taylor, Jared, Josiah, and their newest is Tristan. Five children in seven years. Uh, that's a mini church all by itself. <laughs> James, we love you, our friend, and uh, it's great to have you back on our campus. Would you join me in welcoming Reverend James Womack to our pope this morning? Good morning. How's everyone doing? How's everyone doing? Good. Well, I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and indeed it's a privilege to be here with you guys. Um, on this morning, uh, my wife wanted to be here, but a question she raised on last night um, cautioned my judgment, said maybe that she shouldn't come. She said, I wonder how much of the sermon I'll get to hear um, in light of our five kids. <laughs> and, and so uh, our oldest is um, seven and, and our youngest just turned one. And so we thought it'd be best for her to stay home with the kids today. My kids want to come. My children are homeschooled. My two olds are homeschooled. And they really want to miss a day of homeschooling. So... <laughs> <laughs> So that night here, I want to thank God just for uh, what he's done in my life through Dallas Seminary, and I don't say that lightly, and I don't say this because I'm standing here, but I say it because I'm thankful for what God has done in my life and through my life because of Dallas Seminary. I know for many of you guys, you all come from um, strong family backgrounds and had strong models and things like that when it came to marriage and family, but for me and my wife, um, Dallas Seminary really made an indelible impression upon my heart on what it means to be a godly husband and a um, godly dad. And so I thank God for that, which I've learned here at um, Dallas Seminary. I also want to thank God for just a great faculty and staff. Let's give them a hand, because they invest their lives in us. <laughs> Amen. Um, great faculty, great staff. The Christian Education Department took me up under their wings when I was here in seminary. And even beyond, they didn't want to let me go. They didn't feel like I was ready. So they held on to me to help teach in the department, so I'm going to thank God for that. And of course, Dr. Bailey for his leadership, and we know he's a phenomenal Bible communicator. Amen? Amen. And we also thank God for his leadership. I know there was a question about how, how would the school fare once there was a transition from Dr. Swindoll over to Dr. Bailey. And I don't think that we've seen a ripple. The school's only going up and to the right. Amen? Amen. Let's give Dr. Bailey a hand. He's doing a great job with me. Amen. <laughs> I also want to thank God for my good friend, uh, Dr. Maurice Pugh, and uh, I told him he's been following me around. I lost my dad um, a month ago, and he came down there, and he was ministering to our family, and now he's here again to support me here and preach, and he calls me about each week now just to see how I'm doing and see how things are going to ministry. So I thank God for my brother and my friend, and uh, we thank God for you. If you all have your Bible, tell me the first Kings chapter 3, please. When you get there, say amen. And we finish at 1230. <laughs> I went to go preach at a church one time. I say, Pastor, how long do I have to preach? He said, well, you can preach as long as you like, but we leave at 12. <laughs> Are you at 1 Kings 3? Let's start at verse 4. The king went to, the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. Verse 6, Then Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father. 
according as he walked before you, in truth and righteousness, uprightness of heart toward you. And you have reserved for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne. As it is this day, now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Let's bow. Father, we thank you once again for opportunity, God, to come and to humble ourselves, God, before you by way of your word. We just pray on this morning, God, that you would help us to focus our attention on what you have to say to us. Pray, God, that we'd be better people, better Christians, and better servants as a result of this message. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it all. Amen. Recently, I went to visit someone who was in mourning. Their grandfather had passed away, and I went to go and visit with the family just to go and have a ministry of presence. I wasn't doing the funeral. I was just going just to say hello and to say we love you and we care for you. You're dear to my family. You're dear to our church family as well. And we really are mourning with you during this time. I was flying back to Dallas, Texas, and I knew I was going to have to minister here at the chapel, and it, the plane just started to talk to me. I didn't say God. I said the plane. <laughs> we were there. I said, you know what? A, 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 a cockpit crew is much like those of us who serve in Jesus Christ. You have the pilot, you have the passengers, and you have the flight attendants. Very often, you all know when you're traveling and you're riding over a city or a state, the, the pilot will say, look out your window to the left and you will see such and such and such and such. Those of you all who are on the right-hand side of the plane, look out your right window and you all will see such and such and such and such. And what I observed then was that very often when we're on a plane and the pilot says, look to your left or look to your right, that the passengers see one thing, but the pilot sees something entirely different. And the flight attendants, they really don't see much at all. Their success is determined by how well they follow the instructions of the pilot. The role of the pilot is to get the passengers from one destination to the next destination safely and without incident. The role of the flight attendants is merely just to help the pilot to carry out that mission. When you liken that illustration to those of us who serve in the church and the ministry of Jesus Christ, we know we aren't the pilot, neither the co-pilot. God our Savior is the pilot, amen? amen. But very often we, cons we confuse our role between the flight attendants and the passengers. Very often we think that we are passengers and we're just along for the ride. Everybody else is on the plane for our convenience, and everybody else is just there to help us to make it to a destination. But no, we aren't passengers. In the ministry of Jesus Christ, we are flight attendants. We don't stand for our own mission. We stand for someone else's mission. Our success is determined by how well we support the pilot, and our pilot being Jesus Christ. Amen? In 1 Kings chapter 3, we see one who was a visionary leader of God. His name is Solomon. He comes from a strong pedigree of leaders. We know this story very well because God gave him really a test to see where his heart really was. And I think that each of us, whether it's a professor, whether it's a student, whether it's just a, visit, a visiting preacher, each of us are going to be challenged by God to see where our heart really is. And as I look out today, I see in ministry, I think very often our hearts are in the wrong place. I think when we look at ministry, we measure the success of ministry by merely numbers today. We don't measure it by how committed people are to Jesus Christ, but we say, well, how many, how many sets did you have during service? How many sets of lights do you all have? How many actors do you have? How many, how many services do you have? But Jesus Christ is not asking us how many services we've had, and I'm not against multiple services as a church planner, trust me. <laughs> I'm not against lights. We want to make it so it's a very great learning environment and people can, can connect, but we can very easily mistake the wrong things for success. I think if there's anything we need today as ministers of the gospel, as spiritual flight attendants, following our great pilot, Jesus Christ, if there's anything that we need, it's character. And that character needs to be tempered by wisdom. Now, what's interesting here is that we can confuse knowledge and wisdom. There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. 
Knowledge is merely having the information, having the facts. But wisdom is having the, the, the character, the temperament, the understanding, the discernment, the insight to apply that knowledge that you have. If there's anything I've learned over the last couple of years that you can have a lot of knowledge, but you need wisdom to rule well and to lead well among God's people. Here in 1 Kings chapter 3, we see a young man by the name of Solomon, and indeed he is a young man. He's like many of you all. He's been thrust into ministry. He finds himself coming after a great leader, and now it's his turn to administer among the people of God. And we find five characteristics that God's visionary leader must possess. First off, in verse 6, he says, Then Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father. And what I find interesting here in, in verses 1 through 9, when you read about Solomon, this story here, number one, you see that Solomon has a high view of God. He has a high view of God. If you look throughout verses 6 through verse 9, look at the personal pronouns there. In verse 6, you have shown. In verse 6b, you in truth and righteousness. You have reserved. You have given. Verse 7, now, O oh Lord my God, you have made. Verse 8, your servant, your people, you have chosen. Verse 9, your servant, your people. As you read these three verses or, or these four verses, you can clearly see that the emphasis is not on the servant, but the emphasis is on the one in whom he is serving. Now, I think if we're going to do well to serve God, our character, first off, needs to be, needs to be um, saturated by the character of God. We've got to have a high view of God. Amen? I know in our modern-day society, we're trying to dumb God down. We're trying to help people understand who God is. But I think at some point in time, we, we reduce God to a minimum. We trivialize our great God. And I mean, he's just a pal. He's just my boy. He's just somebody I know. But no, 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 no. At the end of the day, how great is our God? Amen? We serve a great God. Well, how is our God great? Number one, he's great because of his character. He's great because of his character and who he is. Our God is a holy God. Our God is an omniscient God. Our God is an omnipotent God. We serve a great God because of his character. Psalm 150 says, let's praise him according to his excellent. Y'all got an African-American preacher this morning. <laughs> when he pauses, you all chime right in, all right? In. Psalm 150 says, what does it say? His excellent greatness. Thank you, amen. So we serve a great God. He has a great character, but he also has great compassion. What you see here, Solomon makes reference to to, to God's compassion, his, his hesed, his, his, his loyal love, his, his devotion, his loyalty, his commitment to his father. So you know what, my God walk, I mean, my dad walk with you, but boy, you are a great God because you have been so compassionate toward my dad, and that compassion has led to you to preserve his throne. We know that's the Davidic covenant, don't we? And he says, you know what, you have maintained the throne. You are continuing the legacy you chose to start up in my dad's life. You are a compassionate God. Well, boy, why is he compassionate? Because we don't deserve anything from God, do we? We don't deserve anything from God, do we? No, we don't deserve anything from God. And so he says, you, know, you are a God of character. You are a God of compassion. And God, you have wonderful conduct. The fact that you choose to place me in this position, God, it's just, it's just amazing to me. So we must have a high view of God. We also must have a healthy view of God's task. Look at verse 8. It says here in verse 8, Your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. What's interesting here is that before he actually states the content of his prayer, God gave him a character test up in verse 5, and he says, What? What is your prayer request I can answer for you today? And boy, very often, the nature of your prayers dictates the character of your heart. And he says here, you know what? What are you asking for? But, 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 but before he moves any further, he says, you know what? I want you to understand the magnitude of your task. He had to lead the people of Israel. He had to judge among the people. He had to exercise great leadership. And many of you all, if you're not serving already, in a few months, a few years, a few more semesters, you all are going to be leading God's people. 
And the temptation is to think that you have what it takes to make it happen. The temptation is going to be that your Greek and your Hebrew, your theology, your education, CE classes, all those things prepared you for exactly what you're going to do in ministry. And you're going to have the temptation to believe and the audacity and the gall to think, you know what, I'm prepared for this task. The longer I serve in ministry, the more I'm dependent upon God to understand I can't change anybody's life. It's God who changes people's lives. And what I'm merely doing is just being a flight attendant. I'm just serving while God is trying to take people to their ultimate destination. Yes, our service is important, but we cannot confuse the power of God with the power of man. And one of the challenges today is that I see a great emphasis on what man can do and not with what God can do. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you have your Bible, we're coming back to 2 Kings. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, he's talking to the church at Corinth, a very gifted church, in fact. And he tells them, you know what, you all need to be careful. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Watch this now. Not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. We need to make sure that our methodology does not impair our theology. Now, it's okay to have great methods and, and great innovation and great ways of doing things, but we got to understand our role is not to be clever. We cannot become so clever where people miss the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul is speaking, and Paul's a very gifted guy, and you all know that. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. This is not heavenly wisdom he's referencing here. This is manly wisdom. Proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Explanation, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. Why not? But in demonstration of the spirit and of power, why? So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a generation of people who are placing their confidence and their faith in the wisdom of men and not the power of God. In the times that we live in, they're bewildering. When companies like Lehman go down, we're like, well, well how in the world that happen? Companies like AIG who've been strong for years, and now they're folded and wonder, how in the world do you preach to people? How do you minister to people? How do you encourage people? Ladies and gentlemen, we got to have a healthy view of our task. We're not adequate for these things, and only God can pull the task off. Amen? And when we got to have a high view of God, we have to have a healthy view of God's task. Number three, we have to have an humble view of ourselves. Verse 7 here. Now, O Lord, my God... You have, made your, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. That's an interesting statement by Solomon. Solomon says, you know what? You've given me this grand task and you're a great God. Now I've got this major leadership role, but God, I've got no clue what I'm doing. I'm inexperienced. I haven't done it before. The size of the task, Lord, I really can't pull this thing off. And many of us are going to be challenged the same way. So you know what? What is my view of myself? Romans 12, 3 challenges us not to think more of ourselves than we ought to think. God is not saying you ought to be insecure or have false humility. But God said, you know what? You ought to look at yourself rightly. Over in Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he gives us an admonition. He says, you know what? Be careful as you go into ministry. Ministry is rough, and ministry is tough. He says, you know what? We are ministers of new covenants. Verse 4, such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. God says, you know what? We're not adequate in ourselves. When you all go and interview 
before these church boards, be careful how you respond. Respond. It's amazing. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4 tells you, you know what? We're not celebrities, we're servants. And the challenge in our modern day culture is to be a celebrity. People want to make you a celebrity. What's your podcast like? What's your blog like? How many people do you have responding and more interacting with you? How many conferences are you leading? Guys, you know what? We are not adequate in ourselves for what he's called us to. Paul tells us over in 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's okay to reference the Bible like this, isn't it? <laughs> 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. He's emphasizing the deity of Christ. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me in to service. One of the beautiful things here is that Solomon recognizes over in, in 1 Kings chapter 3 that God called him into ministry. It's God who placed him in the ministry. He didn't choose his own place, but God chose him. He has a high view of God. He has a healthy view of God's task. He has an humble view of himself. Many of you are like me. When you wake up in the mornings, you do your devotionals. And I have quite a routine. Part of my routine is CNN and ESPN. <laughs> have those between 3 and 5 o'clock in the morning when all the kids are asleep and I can watch it in peace. So yesterday I had, had the opportunity to watch where a guy ended up with a special caddy. He had won some golfing contest and a guy by the name of Tiger Woods showed up and he wanted to be his caddy for that day. This guy's mind was blown. Say, how in the world did I end up with the world's greatest golfer when he's healthy as my caddy? And Tiger Woods caddy for him for those 18 holes. Now, I said, I wonder how many of us, if we had the world renown of a Tiger Woods, would still have the humility to go and be a caddy for one day. Maybe we shouldn't be the one who's hitting the ball. Maybe we ought to recognize that God just wants us to be humble caddies. Not only must he have an humble view of ourselves, we must also heed God's word. Verse 9a, you all there? He says, so give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. And the first thing that struck me here was that it, this, this has a great correlation over to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. He says that, that the mature, those who work out in God's gymnasium, Gumnazo, thank you, Dr. Bailey. Those who work out in God's gym, they're the ones who by practice, by practice, by obedience, by submission, have that sense of strength to discern between good and evil. As we demark or we notate what it means to be a mature follower of Christ, one of those elements is that, is that a person by practice have their sense of strength to discern between good and evil. And what we see here is some level of continuity with the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we see Solomon who said at first, as you know what, God, give me a heart to judge your people to discern between good and evil. Let me make a footnote here. You cannot judge among people to help them discern between good and evil if you can't discern between good and evil. What he says is, he says, Lord, give me the right kind of heart. God, give me the right kind of relationship. God, not just information, not just knowledge, not just models, but God, give me such a walk with you and, and God, such a flexible heart towards you, God, that God, I can rightfully discern and judge between good and evil among your great people. Are we tracking together? Hopefully, I'll be able to discern between good and evil how to keep this thing on my ear. <laughs> <laughs> before I get done. <laughs> so he says, so you know what? I want you to make sure that you are a heater of God's word because you learn how personally to discern between good and evil by practicing God's truth. Amen? It's not merely knowing God's truth, but it's practicing God's truth. The overall context is that you know, what? You, you know how to handle God's word. You're not you're not a neophyte when it comes to, to handling God, or you become accustomed in managing God's word. Interestingly here, this, this term has the meaning of you, you, you have a heart, you have a mind that, that listens, that responds, that hears. And the context over in Hebrews that you know what? You all have become dull of hearing. And by now you all should be teachers of the law, but you have need for someone to come and teach you the elementary principles of God. Before we can help others discern between good and evil, we have to practice good and evil ourselves. Amen? 
But then he says, God, I want you to help me, God, to discern between good and evil among your people. And that's a hard task. You're sitting there with a couple, husband and wife. You say, is that your final answer? And they look back and say, that's the truth the way I know it. And you've got to help discern. You're dealing with somebody off the street who's in need of discipleship, food, and clothing. You've got to discern if they're telling the truth or not. You're trying to help a young adult to mature in their faith, and they're being faced and bombarded with all sorts of visual stimuli that's challenging their maturity in Christ. You've got to help them discern between good and evil. You've got people who've had long-term jobs who are now losing their jobs, losing their homes. You've got to sit down and help them make decisions, help them to pursue God and to walk with God and to continue to trust in God. You need wisdom. But lastly, we have to honor God's people. 9b says, For who is able to judge this great people of yours? What's interesting here is that we see this term great for a second time, but the great in verse 8 is different from the term great in verse 9. The term great in verse, in verse 8 is, 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 is rava, many. But here's the term great, which, which comes from kavod, which means heavy. It says, for God, who is able to judge this heavy people, this great people, this honorable people of yours? You know, it's interesting when you get into a crowd of pastors these days and you ask them about the people of God, one of the last adjectives you're going to hear is great. They may have some other choice words for the flock. <laughs> but great is not one of them. And boy, as we have the privilege, and boy, it really is a privilege to serve the people of God, as we have the privilege of being flight attendants on the flights that people take with us, we must honor God's people. Remember, these are not your people. They aren't the church's people. They're God's people. And God gives us the grand privilege to go and serve them. The temptation is, you know what, maybe they should be here to serve me. No, 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 no. We're there to serve them with wisdom. You know, I was flying on the plane and I said, well, boy, what about the flight attendants? They get no credit. They get no glory. In fact, they have the worst seats on the plane. But remember, the flight attendants, they get their glory. They get their accolades when the passengers begin to deplane. And it's only after the passengers have been served well by the flight attendants that the flight attendants can say, you know what? We did a good job today. We help make this trip as pleasurable as it can be for our passengers. And we're not the passengers. So good people, do you have the character that it takes to fulfill God's ministry? It's going to be reflected in your prayer life and what you ask God for. Are you asking God for a bigger church, bigger ministry, more resources, more responsibility? Are you asking God, God, you know what? Give me greater wisdom to serve the people you have called me to serve. Now you're talking about caddies, and Tiger Woods' caddy is named Steve. Recently, ESPN did a print story about Steve. Steve's a pretty rich guy today. <laughs> but Steve left his family about the age of 15 or 16 years old because he knew he wanted to be a caddy. You almost wonder, why in the world would somebody choose to be a caddy and not the golfer? Why do you want to go and help support and serve and help somebody else to be successful? But Steve knew at the age of 15 or 16 years old that he didn't want to be a, a worldwide golfer, a world-renowned golfer. But he wanted to be a supporter of those who played the game. I wonder how many of us want to be spiritual caddies today. God, I'm not interested in being the one who's being glorified. I don't have to be the one whose name shows up in the marquee lights. I don't have to be the one who's invited to all the conferences. I don't have to be the one who's got the greatest blog or the greatest website. God, I'm just happy being your caddy. What's the content of your prayer life? What's your character like? You have a high view of God? Do you have a healthy view of the ministry that God's called you to? Do you have a humble view of yourselves? Do you really heed God's word? 
I was with a guy who's a member of one of our alumnus churches up in Portland, Maine. And the guy really impressed me. He said, you know what? I'm finally at a point where I'm moving from knowing about God to loving God. Do you honor God's people? Let's pray that God would give us the right kind of heart and the right character.